day. Yesterday, I began my programme with comments that it seemed as if we were potentially on the brink of a wider Middle East war, with lots of reports, lots of claims that Iran was on the brink of attacking Israel in retaliation for the Israeli strike on Iran's embassy complex in Damascus. I did express some scepticism. I said that it seemed to me that it was fairly clear that a, a trap was being laid for Iran, that there were attempts on the part of the authorities in Israel to provoke Iran into a strong action, which would enable Israel itself to launch strikes on Iran. In fact, there are reports that Israeli, the Israeli Air Force has been rehearsing attacks on Iranian nuclear facilities, and that it was quite plausible that the overall game strategy was to provoke a larger war between Israel and Iran, drag in the United States, where President Biden, most unwisely, has again spoken about American support for Israel being cast iron. He seemed to be giving the Israelis yet another blank check on top of the one that he gave disastrously back in October. And I said that it looked as if that there was this trap being laid with the Israelis trying to lead the Iranians into an attack upon themselves, with the Israelis planning an enormous retaliation and seeking the support of the Americans to effect it. Well, that was yesterday. So far, the Iranians have not let themselves be provoked. They have not yet launched an attack on Israel. And there was claims. I saw a commentary yesterday in Zero Hedge that the Iranians had called off the attack at the last moment because they were worried about American retaliation. There's no way that any outside person not familiar with the internal discussions in Tehran and with the entire intelligence picture can either corroborate or refute that claim. But what I will say is this. Given that this is such an obvious trap, and given that the Iranians have been working very hard ever since the events of 7th October to prevent themselves getting becoming drawn into an all-out battle with Israel and the United States, I would have thought that the Iranians would choose to act with self-control and restraint and would not plunge headlong into an attack on Israel that might provoke the very war that they seek to avoid. And I suspect that that remains the Iranian calculus. And that makes me wonder whether the kind of attack that we've been hearing people talk about has ever been at any point actually part of the Iranian plan. The Iranians have said that they will respond at some point in a time and place of their own choosing. And they've shown previously that that is how they tend to work. They let the immediate storm subside. They wait until their adversary has relaxed and is off their guard. They also are very careful to judge the international climate. And then usually they strike in a way that makes it much less likely that the situation will spiral out of their own control. A further indicator that that is Iran's approach to this event, these, this affair, is that yesterday um, there were reports that the Iranian authorities have said to all of the major powers that Iran might not strike at Israel at all if the UN Security Council uh, convened 
and published a statement criticizing Israel for its attack on Iran's embassy in Damascus. Now, that might be some kind of a threat, a threat perhaps to the international community, but an international community to get behind Iran on this question, or else, <laughs> or it could be, and it looks more plausible to me, that it's another signal, it's intended as another signal, that Iran for the moment is not looking to escalate. Anyway, just saying. Now, my comments yesterday at the start of my program, as I anticipated, have provoked a very wide response. The vast bulk of the comments I've received have essentially um, been in conformity with my own analysis. There has been some pushback from several quarters. Um, there's Again, a repetition of the claim that if Iran was using its embassy as some kind of military facility, that would somehow justify a military strike upon it. That is simply wrong, by the way. That is not at all how international law and the Vienna Convention and all that works. If Israel had information that Iran was conducting a military headquarters or was operating a military headquarters from within its embassy, then the correct and proper thing for Iran to do is to complain to the UN Security Council and ask the Security Council <laughs> uh, uh, to intervene, to try to persuade Iran to modify its actions. Acting unilaterally and without warning, in the way that Israel did, certainly is not something that international law countenances. And of course, Israel gave no warning at all before it launched its strike. And according to the Americans themselves, or at least according to reports, the Americans themselves were not informed in advance. Beyond that, I have to say that there is to me, a fundamental question about this question, about the embassy being used as some kind of military headquarters. And military headquarters in relation to what exactly? Um, what war is being directed from Iran's embassy in Damascus? The United States made clear way back in October that it did not see an Iranian hand behind the Hamas attack on Israel on 7th October. There has been fighting going on, or at least exchanges of fire, between um, Hezbollah and Israel, um, but this is a long-standing thing. It comes and goes. It's been particularly heavy in recent months. But there's no logical reason to think that that would be coordinated by the Iranians in Damascus. The Iranians have plenty of people in Beirut able to talk to Hezbollah directly from there. More likely, if they have a headquarters, directing this sort of thing. It's located in Tehran, just saying. And the same, presumably, would apply to the Houthis also. The kind of strikes the Houthis have been launching at the shipping in the Red Sea, and the one strike they launched against the Israeli port of Eilat. Again, if there is coordination going on between the Iranians and the Houthis over those attacks, well, it's difficult to see why it would be conducted from Damascus. Again, the obvious place to coordinate, it, coordinate those sort of operations is Tehran. I'm leaving aside for the purposes of this program my long-standing view, which I've discussed in many places, that Hamas 
which is principally backed by Qatar, by the way, not by Iran. But Hamas, the Houthis, and Hezbollah are strong organizations with their own agency, fully capable of making decisions by themselves. And it's a misconception to think that they always and invariably and exclusively take their orders from Tehran. But the point I think that needs to be made about this as well is that, of course, Israel, the Israeli authorities, have never made this argument that I have seen being made on Israel's behalf. They've not come forward and said that the diplomatic embassy, that the embassy in Tehran was being used by Iran as some kind of military headquarters. They have not said that Iran is coordinating its war against Israel, whatever war it is that Israel is, that Iran is supposed to be waging against Israel. They've not said that it's being coordinated from the, this embassy. They've not publicly said that the embassy is a command post. And of course, they've not even admitted that they carried out that missile strike on the embassy in Damascus at all. It, it is strange that people come up with these claims. I, I think that it's perhaps better that they did not. I accept that there's probably been some commentary to that effect in the Israeli media, but so far the Israeli government's position, its official position, is that it's not saying anything about this affair at all. And I think, given that that is so, it's a mistake to make excuses for Israel, which it is not making for itself. Anyway, that's all I want to say about this. Uh, for the moment, no general battle, no general war in the Middle East. Iran has not launched the expected or predicted strike on Israel. Perhaps at some point it will. One should not underestimate the political pressures within Tehran itself. But I, will ex I suspect that there are a lot of people in Iran, in Tehran, who are counselling caution. And I am sure that Iran's friends are doing the same. Yesterday, I saw a further report that the Russians have confirmed that they are in almost constant communication with the Iranians over this affair. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say about it. I'm going to move on, and I get to touch briefly before I return to Ukraine on the Crocus City Hall attack. Um, a couple of days ago, the investigative committee published a statement uh, naming certain Ukrainian entities which had provided funding for what the Russian investigative committee said were terrorist attacks that had been carried out by Ukraine on Russian territory. And very understandably, people linked that comment with the Crocus City Hall attack. And they particularly honed in on the fact that amongst, well, the one company identified by name by the Russian investigative committee as providing funding is a company in Ukraine known as Marisma. And of course, that company has achieved a certain notoriety because for a time it employed the president's son on its board at a very, very substantial level of remuneration. Anyway, I do want to make one important point. I did not see this statement as specifically referring or referencing Crocus City Hall. It, it was talking about other attacks, which it is now universally acknowledged have been carried out by the Ukrainians on Russian territory and which have resulted in the deaths of individuals within Russia. And it could be, it probably is connected 
in some way to the Crocus City Hall investigation. But for the moment, again, it's important not to jump to conclusions. It is intriguing that the Russians are linking this particular company to all these strange covert Arctic activities that the Ukrainians have been conducting in Russia itself and the various murders that they've committed there. Um, be interesting to know what the evidence for all of this is. Maybe some kind of a pattern is starting to emerge. But for the moment, we still have more questions than answers. So if the questions do lead us, are answered, and that the answers do lead us in the direction that the investigative committee is pointing towards, then at that point, it might be useful to revisit the Burisma affair, because it might be the case that this company has been fulfilling a somewhat different role from the one that was previously supposed. But anyway, let's wait and see what further information um, the Russians come up with. Now, there is one further point I want to make about the Crocus City Hall investigation, and that is that there is an investigation underway and that the Russians are waiting for its outcome. They've taken no action against Ukraine, for example, or the Western powers that they say, or some of Russian officials say, might have been implicated in the Crocus City Hall attack. They've taken no action for the moment, and they seem to be waiting to see what the investigation comes up with. Now, that is different from things that the Western powers have previously done. I still remember, for example, how um, during the Skripal affair, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, went up, went to the House of Commons, made a comment saying that Russia was highly likely the party involved. I thought that was most wrong. And then within a few hours after the Russians refused, as Theresa May said, uh, demanded to come clean. This is, by the way, before, before the investigation had actually got properly underway. Anyway, at that point, the British started to take action against the Russians, expelling diplomats and doing that kind of thing and organising a mass expulsion of Russian diplomats across Europe. So that is not what the Russians have done. They have not yet expelled any Western diplomats from Moscow. They've not launched any strikes against Ukraine. Um, they're saying that they're still waiting for the results of the investigation and that they're still seeking to identify the people behind it. Now, there are aspects of what the Russians have done, which I think some might object to. I think that statements have been made by Russian officials, <coughs> which could be <coughs> construed as steers, which might arguably be putting pressure on the investigators to come up with certain answers. But one ought to also take note of the fact that the Russians, for the moment at least, are doing something which in the West we no longer seem able to do, which is to wait, let an investigation run its course, and only then decide what action should be taken. Well, having all said all of that, let me now turn and return, in fact, to the main topic of these videos for the last two years plus, which is, of course, the war in Ukraine. And the short and simple summary that can be given about this war 
the state of this war at the moment is that Ukraine is being smashed. Its energy system is being destroyed or at the very least mortally damaged. Its armies are being battered on the battlefronts. It's losing ground right across the front lines and its leaders are becoming increasingly desperate as they seem to sense that the situation for themselves and for their country is starting to fall apart. Now, as I rather thought might happen, so the Russians followed up the first big strike on the Ukrainian energy system that took place uh, um, um, uh, uh, under two days ago, two nights ago, to be more precise. Um, that they seem to have followed it up with another missile strike early this morning. I've not yet f had full details of this, but um, no doubt that information will start to come through. But clearly, the Russians are continuing their attacks on Ukraine's energy system. And by the way, there's been an interesting development because this big power station this thermal power station located south of Kiev, which was destroyed um, in the attack that took place two nights ago. Um, there's been examination of the debris, and it's been decided, it's been acknowledged now, that the missiles that destroyed this power station, or at least some of them, were not... Kinjal hypersonic missiles, but were KH-69 subsonic cruise missiles. Now, the KH-69 is an interesting missile. It's relatively modern, very new. It's very stealthy. It, fl it, it flies at high subsonic speeds, um, close to the ground. Um, it's apparently... Um, difficult to track, and because it flies at high sub subsonic speed, difficult to track by ground radars specifically. And it has a range, well, the original claims were of around 300 kilometers, which would be roughly the same as the Anglo-French Storm Shadow. But these missiles apparently were launched from a distance of around 400 kilometers, which makes it rather more like the Taurus missile, the Swedish-German Taurus missile we were hearing so much about. Now, the most interesting fact about this missile, however, which it seems the Ukrainians have no means to intercept, they are not able to keep their aircraft, uh, they aren't able to operate AWACS, early warning and control aircraft flying over the skies of Ukraine, monitoring, able to track subsonic missiles. Um, their ground radars are being destroyed. It's very, very difficult for them to intercept and destroy cruise missiles like this. Anyway, the most interesting fact about these missiles is that they are part of the equipment of the Suhoi 57 fifth generation stealth fighter jet of the Russian Air Force. Now, the Suhoi 57 entered service with the Russian Air Force about two years ago. It's been in early series production. Apparently, the numbers are now growing. The last estimated figure was that the Russians were operating around 22. The Russian Air Force was operating around 22. The, that number has probably increased. There are reports that from this year, all production of the Suhoi 57 will transfer to the new AL-51 engine, which will 
significantly improve the Sukhoi 57's flight performance. But anyway, we've not had many reports about the Sukhoi 57 being used in the zone of the special military operation. And we know that it has been used. The Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, about a year ago, mentioned the fact that it had been. He said that it had performed superbly, but we've not seen much actual definable evidence of this. Every so often, Ukrainian aircraft get shot down by ultra-long-range R-37M Russian air-to-air -air missiles. There's been some speculation that these have been launched by Sukhoi-57 from time to time, but the general consensus now is that the launch aircraft for these air-to-air -air missiles is mostly, or perhaps entirely, the well-known MiG-31. It could be, it could be, that the attack on the thermal power station was carried out in a particularly stealthy way with Russian stealth fighters, Sukhoi 57s, launching from a significant distance stealthy subsonic uh, ground hugging high speed cruise missiles, stealthy cruise missiles at these at this power station. And that this is the first really big case of the Suhoi fifty seven participating in the battle. And of course if this is true and if the Russians are now using stealthy stealth aircraft and stealth you operating with stealth missiles to carry out attacks of this kind, then given the state of Ukraine's air defense systems, that's only going to add even further to Ukraine's problems. Now, I'm not going to explore this further. People who know an awful lot more about aircraft and fighter jets and missiles can do that. Um, and I'll be very interested to see what they have to say. But it does seem to me plausible given the importance of the target attacked that the Russians did attack it in this rather elaborate way. Now, that's the attack on the thermal power plant. Vladimir Putin has said a number of things about these missile strikes, uh, these attacks on the Ukrainian energy system. And he's also had quite a lot to say about the state of negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. Um, this is what he said about the power stations, and I'm going to start with that first. He said, and this is addressing um, Lukashenko, you are well aware that, unfortunately, we have seen a re recently a series of strikes on our energy facilities, and we had to respond. I would like to emphasize that in winter time, gui guided by humanitarian con considerations, we did not launch any strikes on energy facilities. I mean, they wanted to have our so social institutions hospitals and so on, left without power supply. But after a series of strikes on our energy facilities, we had to respond. I repeat once again, if everything gets down to solving the issues we talked about from the outset, and we'll come to that in a moment, and in the energy sector they are related, among other things, to solving one of the tasks that we set for ourselves, which is demilitarization. Above all, we will proceed from the fact that in this way we directly impact the military-industrial complex of Ukraine. 
But if we do get to the point where I started, if we move on to talks about resolving all the issues in other ways, then, of course, as I have already said many times, we are ready for that. So, he's trying to say, he's taking here two things, three things. Firstly, he's saying that the Russians are responding to these attacks because the Ukrainians have been attacking Russian refineries. I don't take that especially seriously. And the fact that Putin said that the Russians waited until the winter was over before launching these strikes on the Ukrainian energy system. Well, to my mind, that strongly argues against the theory that the Russians are simply engaging in retaliatory strikes because of the Ukrainian attacks on their own refineries. So that is the first thing. The second point that he's making is that from a Russian point of view, this is all now connected to the topic of demilitarization. The Ukrainians are attacking the Russian energy system, the refineries, because they've still got a military. And one of the objectives of the special military operation is basically to deprive Ukraine of its military so that it can no longer pose a military threat to Russia. So what Putin is also going on to say, and this is perhaps important, is if these operations, these military attacks on the energy system of Ukraine are to stop, then that can only happen as part of the overall process of demilitarization of Ukraine. In other words, the Russians will continue to hit Ukrainian energy facilities, or at least consider themselves free to hit Ukrainian energy facilities until that point when some kind of peace in Ukraine is finally negotiated and achieved. Whilst the special military operation organ continues, given the way the Ukrainians have been behaving, as shown by Ukraine's attacks on Russia's special uh, uh, um, uh, oil refineries, the Russians will consider themselves free to continue to attack Ukraine's energy system. You have to somewhat unpack the points that Putin is making here to see actually exactly what he means or to be more precise what he is thinking. Now, he had a lot to say about negotiations as well. And this he said, as I said, over the course of this meeting with Lukashenko. And he says this, we have never rejected a peaceful settlement of disputes. Moreover, this is what we were inclined to do. It was not Russia that started this war in 2014. Note the year. Everything began with the coup d'etat in Ukraine. Later, when everything moved to a hot phase, he is speaking now, about the launch of the special military operation in February 2022, you, meaning Lukashenko, initiated the conduct of peace negotiations in Belarus. We launched them in two cities. The negotiating teams moved to Turkey, to Istanbul. We largely completed this work there, which took us much time and effort. We initialed it on both sides. Ukraine also initialed it. This paper, this document was initialed. As you know, later, under pressure from the West, the Ukrainian side opted out of these agreements. I would like to remind you that at the time we were told that we could not sign the document in this manner, that Ukraine could not sign the document with a gun to its head, and we had to withdraw our troops from Kiev. So we did. Immediately after we did that, our agreements were discarded. So he then goes on to say this. 
Now, as you know, the idea of holding some kind of conference in Switzerland is being promoted. We are not invited there. Moreover, the, they think that we have nothing to do there. And at the same time, they say that nothing can be solved without us. Since we are now not going there, it has now turned into a kind of nonsense. They say that we refuse to negotiate. We were not invited, but they say that we refuse. It would, it would be funny if it were not so sad. Once again, I would like to emphasize that we are in favor of talks, but not in the format of being imposed any schemes that have nothing to do with reality. Why do I say that? Because if the need arises, I will allow myself to turn to you and maybe we will continue consultations with you in this area. So what Putin is saying is this. He says, look, we're not going to, we're not ruling out talks. We're not ruling out talks to the last Ukrainian. By no means. We made a major effort to come to an agreement with the Ukrainians at the start of the conflict in 2022. A document was agreed. It was initialed. The West sabotaged it. The Ukrainians then decided that they would continue the war, and they have been doing that ever since. Now things have started to go wrong for the West. And because of that, because of this situation, they're now coming to us People are now coming to us, the Swiss to be precise. The conference that he's talking about is one which Switzerland is trying to convene in June, a peace conference that Switzerland is trying to convene in June. They're trying to come up with this conference in June. They're saying that there cannot be peace without us. At the same time, they don't want us. At this conference, we are not interested in this conference. If the point ever comes that negotiations must arise, well, then in that case, we're prepared to go back to you, to Lukashenko, to, the Bel to the Belarus. Belarus can then communicate our ideas directly to the Ukrainians, and then maybe we can move forward and agree peace. So it's a pretty tough position. In fact, he emphasizes that a bit further. He says that they, or at least the opposite side, have driven themselves into a corner to a certain extent by refusing to negotiate, expecting to defeat Russia on the battlefield, to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia. Now, having understood that this is impossible and having refused to negotiate, they have found themselves in a predicament. But our goal is not to put any, everyone in a tough spot, just the F opposite. We are ready for constructive effort, but clearly nothing from detached from reality can be imposed on us. So we're winning the war. That fact has to be recognized. We're not slamming the door and absolutely rejecting talks, but they have to be based on the realities of the situation. And today, shortly after those words of Putin's, his spokesman, Dmitry Peskov spelled it all out. He said the following, and this is now, I'm taking this from this Russian news agency, the official news agency, TASS. This, the return to negotiations, is possible only in the form of dialogue, readiness for dialogue. Our readiness for negotiations was confirmed yesterday by President Putin. As a rule, negotiations are still based on something. It was said that, among other things, we could rely on this document, the Istanbul Treaty. But, of course, a lot of things have taken place since then. We have new subjects in the Constitution, 
which was not the case two years ago. Therefore, there are indeed a number of new realities that we cannot abstract from, but at the same time, this could be, this treaty, the Istanbul Treaty, could be a certain base for the start of negotiations. President Putin has repeatedly emphasized, confirmed his readiness for such talks. The president has also previously spoken about our resident readiness. It was a confirmation of our well-known position, which is often distorted in the statements of various representatives. It was said and emphasized that attempts to hold forums in search of a settlement without Russia's participation can hardly be considered rational and potentially fruitful. So we come back to what um, Shoigu said to the French Defence Minister Le Cornu in that discussion which took place some days ago, which I've discussed extensively on this channel, and which was also discussed um, at length by myself and my colleague Alex Christoforo of the Dur Duran. Um, no way are we, the Russians, agreeing to a settlement of conflict freeze. No way are they going back to what was almost agreed in Istanbul. Istanbul, as Lavrov said, was essentially destroyed by the Western powers when they sabotaged it and persuaded the Ukrainians to walk away from it with the promise of unlimited support until Russia was defeated. So now, simply because Russia has not been defeated and Russia is winning the war, we're not prepared to go back to Istanbul and certainly not to a conflict freeze idea. We are prepared to take Istanbul as a starting point for further negotiations. But <laughs> realities have to be taken into account. The four regions, Kherson, Zaporozhye, Donetsk and Lugansk, and of course Crimea, are now part of Russia. And that has to be acknowledged and must be for, must be an essential part of the negotiation process. And, of course, the rest of Istanbul, or the other parts of the Istanbul Agreement, we can certainly look at. And, of course, one of the things that Istanbul completely ruled out was Ukraine joining NATO. So, what the Russians are saying is, yes, we are prepared to talk, but it can only be on the basis of Istanbul plus. Ukraine not joining NATO. Ukraine demilitarizing, scaling its down its military to a very great extent. We now know that was part of the draft agreement reached at Istanbul. Yes, Ukraine carrying out steps to um, reduce the influence of, and indeed even eliminate, the influence of the ideology of the 1930s in Ukraine. We now know that that was also a part of Istanbul. Ukraine absolutely not joining NATO, maintaining its neutral status, as part of a treaty. Ukraine accepting security guarantees, including from Russia. This was also part of Istanbul. Security guarantees, which gave the Russians the right of veto over the presence of foreign troops on Ukrainian territory up to and including troops who were merely there for exercises. That was also a part of Istanbul. Plus, Ukrainian recognition that the four regions 
Zaporozhye, Kherson, Donetsk, Lugansk and Crimea are now part of Russia. It is a very tough series of positions, but that's what the Russians are now saying. They're prepared to go for Istanbul Plus, but the terms are going to be very, very much harder than they were back in 2022. Now, there is an alternative, and the Russians clearly do not believe that Ukraine is going to accept this, that it will ever accept Istanbul Plus. I don't think the Russians expect the Western powers to expect Istanbul Plus either. And the Russians are making it fairly clear that they expect an entirely different outcome which is that this will all be decided on the battlefield and that it will end with the Russians dictating terms. It will not be agreed between Russia and Ukraine. It will not be agreed between Russia and the West. And this was clearly signalled in a debate which took place in the Security Council, the UN Security Council yesterday. This was a debate convened at the request of the Western powers who were um, trying to mobilize international opposition to the Russian missile strikes on Ukraine's energy system. And, well, you can actually find, if you search on Twitter X, the video of the Russian ambassador, Vasily Nebenzia, making his comments. But this is how the UN itself reports them. The representative of the Russian Federation said that the only reason for convening today's meeting is for the Kiev regime's Western sponsors to keep the topic of Ukraine afloat with the requisite optics. During the special meeting on 15th April, that's on Monday, Moscow will address shelling and drone attacks on the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, which it resumed a few days ago. He added, voicing hope that a fair assessment of what is happening will also be given by the leadership of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And now we get to the killer sentence. The Russian armies are advancing across all fronts. This trend won't be reversed by a new Western aid package. Very soon, the only topic that any international meeting on Ukraine will be the unconditional surrender of the Kiev regime. This trend won't be reversed by a new Western aid package. Very soon, the only topic at any international meeting on Ukraine will be the unconditional surrender of the Kiev regime. Now, those are incredibly tough words. They are clearly what the Russians expect to happen over the next few months. I think it is inconceivable that Ambassador Nebenzia, who is one of Russia's top diplomats, will have said something like that to the UN Security Council if he had not been specifically authorised to say it by Moscow. Note that he didn't need to make that observation in a discussion over the dis course of the discussion that took place, which was about the attacks by the Russians on the energy system in Ukraine. And if you take a step back, you can clearly see the thinking from the Russians. What they're saying is this. Look, we're not prepared to rule out negotiations. We're certainly not prepared to turn up to this phony conference 
in Switzerland that's going to happen in June. We don't accept that the Swiss are even neutral any longer. They pretended they are neutral ever since the uh, Treaty the Treaty of Vienna back in 1815, where Swiss neutrality was recognized, but they have fundamentally violated their neutrality over Ukraine. They've clearly backed the Western powers over Ukraine. They've imposed sanctions upon us, which are obviously violations of sanctions. Besides, what we know about this conference that's going to happen in June is that it's all constructed around Zelensky's formula, which has clearly been drawn up by the Ukrainians together with the Western powers. This demands our effective capitulation, withdrawal from all territories of pre of post-1991 Ukraine. That isn't going to happen. But what we are prepared to discuss is Istanbul Plus. Istanbul, in other words, no NATO for Ukraine, much scaled down military for Ukraine, strong protections for Russian speakers in Ukraine, action taken to erase the presence of this ideology of the 1930s in Ukraine. All of that, plus Ukrainian acceptance that the four regions, Zaporozhye, Kherson, Donetsk, Lugansk, Crimea, are part of Russia. And I expect it will actually go a bit beyond that. I personally think, given that the Russians have already said how poor their trust in the West is, how non-existent their trust is, that they will certainly want to see political change in Kiev, they will want to see the current government in Kiev replaced by a new one. And I also suspect they will want their own military to have a presence in part of Ukraine, possibly in places like Kiev and Odessa and Kharkiv, just saying. But that's, those are terms. The Russians are signalling their terms. But they're also saying that if those terms are not accepted and it's hardly likely that they will be, no consensus to do so exists in the West, no willingness to contemplate that exists in Ukraine. If these terms are not accepted, then the war will end with Ukraine's unconditional surrender. And soon, going back to Nebenzi's words, the only topic at any international meeting on Ukraine will be the unconditional surrender of the Kiev regime. The Russians will impose terms. And they will be terms not of negotiation, but of capitulation. Now, you have to piece it all together. You have to take all the various different parts together, but you can see clearly where it's leading. And, well, I discussed earlier how the energy system, Ukraine's energy system, is being smashed. And, by the way, the same is now true on the battlefronts. Now... It's not entirely easy sometimes to keep track of what's going on in the battlefronts because we're talking about fighting going on in many different places. But to repeat again, a point that I've made many times, fighting is now happening in several places at once and the Russians are advancing in all of these places. So in Avdevka now, it looks like the Russians have advanced significantly to the north from uh, Krasnogorovka, which they captured in March of last year. This is the village of Krasnogorovka to the north, to the northeast, actually, of Avdevka. They're pushing up the railway lines. The railway lines are on a hill. They are now outflanking 
the village of Novom Kalinova, which is located to the west of the railway line. It's on low land to the west of the railway line. They're pushing beyond that railway line. They will soon be outflanking the rather bigger village, apparently, of Keramik, which is to the north of Novokalinova. There are some reports that Russian troops have actually entered Novokalinova itself. And it is very likely, indeed it is highly likely, that with Stepovoy now securely under Russian control and with the Russians gradually gaining control of the area to the north of Berdichi and before long of that particular village itself, if they have not captured it already. Anyway, with the Russians on the railway north of Stepove, Stepovoye, they are likely to push up another railway line to the west of um, Novokalinova towards Ocheretino. And one way or the other, Novokalinova, Ocheretino, clearly now Keramik, now all looking like Russian objectives. And the Ukrainians seem unable to hold back this Russian steamroller. And of course, if the Russians capture Novokalinovo, Keramik, Ocheretino, Novo Bakhmutivka, which is a village immediately to the south of Ocheretino, then at that point, realistically, um, they're in a very strong position indeed, either to advance east, northeastwards, towards Pavlograd, outflanking and perhaps encircling Ukrainian troops in the area of uh, Tosca, Torske and uh, um, this village known as New York, or conceivably they could push northwest towards um, Pakrovsk and towards the deeper river. So this is a very powerful and dangerous advance. And there are also now lots of reports that the Russians have actually entered Umanska and um, 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 Yasnobrodovka, immediately to the south of Umanska, and Nitalovo as well, that there is intense fighting going on for all of these places um, at the present time. So it looks as if we're looking at a major Russian advance west and north of Avdevka. And also, by the way, south of Avdevka, where also there's been intense fighting going on in Krasnogorovka itself. The Russians are bombing Krasnogorovka intensely, intensively. Apparently, FAB 1500 bombs have been dropped on Ukrainian positions in Krasnogorovka. The Russians have reached the central part of Krasnogorovka, where apparently some factory buildings are located. This is presumed to be the sort of citadel there. Pervomaisky fell some days ago. The Russian Defense Ministry has not yet confirmed that because probably the Ukrainians, with still retaining a presence in the tile level, are able to interfere with Russian control in the far western fringe of Pervomaisky. But the Russians are in a position now that they hold Pervomaisky and also Novoskoy to the south to cut off Krasnogorovka's supplies from the west and to attack Krasnogorovka from the north. So Krasnogorovka, situation for the Ukrainians deteriorating there fast. That's Avdevka, perhaps in some ways the single, continuing to be the single most intense area of the fighting. We've had a lot less news about movements of forces in the Chasov Yar battle. Though that does not mean that movements are not happening. In fact, I'm sure they are. I'm sure the Russians have advanced further.
within the micro district. I'm sure that the Russians have advanced also further uh, um, in their outflanking manoeuvres around Chasafyar. We haven't heard news from Kalinina, this village to the west of Bogdanovka, whether that's been attacked or captured or even entered so far, but not impossible that all of those things have happened. And nor have we heard more news about Russian advances from Ivanivska towards uh, the canal, though that probably is also happening. There has been a fair amount of news about intense fighting uh, in the areas to the north and west of Klesheevka and in Klesheevka itself. That, of course, is the bitterly fought-over village south of Bakhmut. The Wagner organization captured it in 2023. The Ukrainians fought bitterly to recapture it during their summer offensive. Now the Russians are coming back. They're pushing the Ukrainians out of Klesheevka. Perhaps by now they control all of Klesheevka. This is a, a sideshow. The main attack is happening further uh, north, to the northwest in Chasafya. But what we are getting, the main news, is again of intense Russian bombing, of the Sukhoi 25s operating without restriction over the skies of Chasafya and of the Russian fab. And now all dabs, these are thermobaric bombs which explode with extraordinary power. Um, anyway, bombs dropping on Chasafya. Uh, Ukrainians seeing their defenses crumble in the face of this rain of bombs and, of course, suffering terrible losses in the process. There's also been... A lot more news from Siversk. This is further north of Bakhmut. Here we're now starting to get quite a lot of news. Not always easy to understand exactly what is happening. It does seem, however, as if the Russians um, are continuing their gradual encirclement of Ukrainian troops in Belogorovka. But also, and rather confusingly, they seem to have launched attacks on two other villages to the south of Belogorovka and to immediately to the west, to the east rather, of Siversk itself. Uh, these are called Verho, Verhno Kamyanka and Verhno Kamyanska. Very similar names, but they are different places and they're not identical. Anyway, it seems that the Russians have launched attacks seeking to capture those two villages. Uh, it's been pointed out that if Verkhno Kamyanska falls, the next town immediately to the west is Siversk itself. And that the Russians are also um, pushing up the railway towards Siversk from the south, um, reaching this railway station at Vimka. And there's also reports that the Russians have been bombing, in fact, they've been doing it for about two weeks now, Ukrainian positions in the village of Razdo Razdolovka to the southwest of Siversk, aiming to capture that village. It's a complex battle that appears to be developing here, but it does look as if um, Siversk has been taken in a ring and... If the Russians capture Belogorovka, Ver Verkhno Kamyanska and Verkhno Kamyanka and are also able to advance from the north, which they might be able to do, um, well, and from the south, then it's not impossible that a cauldron could eventually form around Siversk itself. And we will see whether or not the Ukrainians let themselves be put in that position. To repeat again, if Siversk falls, then basically 
the main town to the west of Siversk is Slavyansk. And probably at that point, the Russians will resume their offensive towards places like Yampol and Liman, Yampol uh, and um, Terny, which we've been hearing so much about recently. Um, Yampol, uh, the Yampol, Liman, all on the, or close on, on the um, Zherevets River. Um, and by the way, on the subject of Terny, subject of lots and lots of comments, there's reports that the Russians are advancing towards Terny again. This time, their main axis of advance is slightly to the northeast of the places where we've been hearing about the fighting happening previously. So it could be that the Russians have simply shifted direction. But anyway, lots of fighting going on there as well. And last but not least, there's been reports that further south, in the Vremevka salient, the Russians have now entered Urozhanye and are close to Staromayorsk. These two villages, again, bitterly fought over by the Ukrainian offensive, in, during the Ukrainian offensive in the summer. It's clear to me that these are simply, this is again, simply a sideshow, and that the main fighting continues to be in central Donbass. So, there we go. Major Russian advances, massive Russian bombing. The West, apparently, very uncertain what to do. There's a report in Bloomberg, in fact, there's been two reports in Bloomberg over the last few hours. One, talking about the massive attacks by the Russians on Ukraine's energy system. Also speaking about concerns that Ukrainian defences might collapse at some point in a few weeks. That's one report from Bloomberg. A second report from Bloomberg, rather more interesting in some ways, telling us about the deep frustrations within the Biden administration. The $61 billion aid package is once again um, the subject of massive horse trading in Congress. Doesn't seem to be moving forward at all fast. The um, populist wing of the Republican Party, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, bitterly opposed to this package being passed at all. At least they want to see movement on sorting out the problem on the border first. That is probably the majority position amongst most Americans. Anyway, that's, uh, for the moment, it looks as if um, Speaker Johnson, where he'd been talking a few days ago about putting a appropriations package for Ukraine for a vote to the House, um, in mid-April, it now looks as if that might be postponed again. And it seems the Biden administration, the president himself, deeply frustrated about that. The president supposedly also deeply frustrated about the fact that the Europeans are having cold feet, not just about seizing Russia's assets, frozen assets, but about seizing the interest of those frozen assets. To repeat, the Europeans have been warned not to do it by their own banks, by their own central banks, by the overwhelming advice of their lawyers, and they've been reminded of the fact that legal cases could be brought against Euroclear, not just in Europe, in European courts, where the situation might be controlled to some extent, but in jurisdictions totally outside the West's control, for example, Hong Kong and Singapore, where large assets exist and where these um, Western agencies also operate. So, Europeans very nervous about moving forward with that as well. By the way, they've also had further warning of how unpredictable legal processes can potentially be.
two Russian business people, uh, uh, um, Michal Friedman and Pyotr Aven, notorious characters, by the way, in Russian history. Aven, for a time, was a minister in one of Boris Yeltsin's governments. Just say. Anyway, they've been sanctioned by the Western powers. Um, their assets in Europe and Britain, and I believe the United States, have been seized. Friedman has been furious about this. He's gone back to Russia, where he's complained bitterly about the way in which the Western powers have treated him. He has been, by the way, historically, very aloof, to put it mildly, from President Putin and his government. He is in no conceivable shape or form a supporter or friend of President Putin. Anyway, he and his friend Arvin, they are partners. They set up Alpha Bank, one of Russia's big private banks, together back, I think it was in the 90s. Anyway, they brought a case in the European Court of Justice against the sanctions which were imposed on them by the European Union, and the European Court of Justice has overturned the sanctions. It says that there is no sign that Friedman or Arven were in any way connected with the decisions taken by the Putin government back in February 2022 that led to the special military op operation. In other words, Friedman and Arven are innocent men. Now, that may not mean actually as much as people think. Um, as was pointed out in uh, a program that we did yes, uh, yesterday um, with the Portuguese um, legal lawyer and legal uh, scholar and political commentator and international affairs commentator, Alejandro um, um, Guitero, um, the fact that Friedman and Arvin won their cases in the European Court of Justice doesn't mean that sanctions can't be and won't be continued to be applied on other people. I should say that if I was advising Friedman and Arvin, I would also say to them that it doesn't mean that sanctions might not be applied against them also as well. In other cases that have happened before, people from various countries, Iran as well as Russia, who brought cases to the European Court of Justice, have indeed managed to get judgments from the European Court of Justice, which say that sub sanctions were imposed on them improperly and are therefore set aside. And then what happens is that almost immediately the European Council simply responds by imposing sanctions on people, on those people, all over again. And it's a cynical and, in my opinion, lawless game, but it continues to be done. And I would not be surprised if the same were done to Friedman and Arvin. Having said that, what this episode again illustrates, going back to the question of the frozen assets, is that you can never completely rely on the courts to do that which you want them to do. The courts, some judges at least, do feel themselves obliged to follow the law, and that can result in awkward and embarrassing outcomes, especially when the law is against you, and especially in jurisdictions that you can't control. So, President Biden, the administration might fume about European hesitation to seize the interests and even the assets themselves, the Russian assets themselves, but there are in fact good reasons why the Europeans are very nervous about going there. But the point is, and this is the key point about the Bloomberg article, it acknowledged that the administration has no plan B. They have no real idea what to do. I mean, even if the money comes as an abenzier, 
Vasily de Benzia, Russia's ambassador, has just told us at the Security Council, it won't make a difference, it won't change anything, to repeat his words, these are his exact words, this trend, the Russian army is advancing on all fronts, this trend won't be reversed by a new Western aid package. And I don't think anybody doubts that that is true. But despite that, there is apparently no plan B. And, or at least the Biden administration doesn't have one. And, of course, we still have the European plan B, President Macron's idea of sending Western troops to Ukraine and gambling, if things go wrong, that the Americans might come to Europe's rescue, that the French and the British troops who find themselves in Ukraine, if Macron gets his way and who are going to be attacked by the Russians, well, the Americans will step in to save them. There is something happening now which ought to give a very strong cautionary note. The Ukrainians getting are becoming increasingly desperate. President Zelensky has made all kinds of astonishing claims. He says that he wants all, essentially, the entirety of the West's air defense missiles. He says that he wants NATO and Ukrainian NATO and EU membership for Ukraine to happen essentially now, immediately. He is talking once more about a further Ukrainian offensive. The Ukrainian parliament, following a debate in which hardly anyone showed up, has now voted through this long argued about mobilization law. It will take months for enough men to appear to fill up the gaps in the Ukrainian army. Most unlikely that it will, that, that those gaps can be filled. The people who are being enlisted will be the young. I find this a terrible thing, actually. I've already made my deep misgivings about this absolutely clear. But anyway, Zelensky, now that he's got his mobilization law, now that he thinks that he's going to get several hundred thousand more men, he's dreaming about yet another Ukrainian offensive in the summer. But he wants all these weapons. He wants all the West's air defense weapons, all the West's uh, missiles so that he can carry out this offensive successfully. And the fact is, as none other than Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, has to all intents and purposes said, the West cannot provide Ukraine with more air defense missiles because it doesn't have any to give. Now, if that is so, and there is no reason to doubt this, then Western troops entering Ukraine to fight the Russians, because that's what it would come to, are going to be going in effectively naked. They won't have the necessary air cover either, unless Western air forces are committed. Nobody knows what the effect of that would be but it would certainly risk World War III. There are no good outcomes to this war in Ukraine for the West now. The Russians have made their proposals. Putin has spoken, and so has Peskov on his behalf, so has Nebenzia. We now have the ultimatum in effect clearly set out. Either it's Istanbul plus, no Ukraine entry to NATO, demilitarization, denazification, plus loss of the four regions and Crimea, and probably more things beyond that, or the unconditional surrender of Ukraine.
the real plan B, the only one that makes sense, is to take up Putin's offer and to negotiate for a deal based on Istanbul Plus. I don't see a single official in the West, in the European Union, in the major Western powers, in the United States, advocating it. But unless we do that, it will be, at best, a debacle greater than Vietnam, greater than Afghanistan. Even Boris Johnson has just come out now and said that. Or it will be a catastrophe of unimaginable dimensions. That is where bungling and incompetent Western statesmanship has led us to. Well, this is where I finish my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop. Buy yourself the amazing things that you will find there. Magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. Last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again. More from me soon. Have a very good day.